Hi, y'all. Um, Bible verse today is John 11, 29 through 35. If you're in the, on your pew Bible, it's page 1669. If you're on your own Bible, I don't know. Um, when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not, had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. When our kids were young, we would usually spend our vacations visiting our families. And when we visited Colleen's mother, we would usually attend her home church. And the, the pastor there, who was a good friend of the family, would offer prizes to children who would come up to him after service and say a Bible verse from memory. But after a while, he put a restriction on those prizes. And he would say, no more John 11.35. You know, that's too easy. No more Jesus wept and then expect to get a prize. This is the shortest verse in all the Bible, and so therefore very easy to memorize. It stands apart from other verses, but still it is very rare to have a, a verse with just a few words, let alone just two words. Jesus wept. Of course, when the Bible was written, it wasn't divided into chapters and verses. That was done later by editors. But whoever the editors were who did that, I believe they were very perceptive and insightful to separate these two little words into its own verse. They stand apart as being very significant. It's a very fascinating and intriguing thing for us to realize that Jesus wept. Why would Jesus, who we preach as God himself in the flesh, who was sovereign over all things, who created everything and is in control of everything, why would Jesus ever have to weep? If there was something to cry about, he could just change it and make it all better. In this case, that's exactly what he did, but first he wept. There are at least three different times recorded in scriptures that Jesus wept. I'd like us to, to look this morning at those different times that Jesus wept and then talk about what that means for us. But before I do that, let me just make a couple general observations about these three occasions that teach us some things in the face of the fact that Jesus wept. First of all, we see that it was prophesied about the Messiah in Isaiah 53.3 that he would be despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, and familiar with suffering, or acquainted with grief is how I learned it. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. The tears of Jesus reveal the fact that as well as being God's anointed one to be God with us in the flesh, that he was also a human being with human emotions like everyone else. He shed tears as all humans do from time to time. In fact, that was kind of the defining thing about who he was. He was a man of sorrows. And secondly, people who weep do not usually have much of a following. As the old saying goes, laugh and the whole world laughs with you, but weep and you weep alone. Jesus, as the man of sorrows, was not who people wanted him to be. And therefore he was rejected and he has been rejected by those who want him to be something else. But he was a man of sorrows and on at least three occasions Jesus shed tears. The first occasion was here at the grave of his close friend Lazarus. These were tears of compassion for the pain of his friends. Lazarus, as I'm sure you know, was the brother of Mary and Martha and all three were very close friends of Jesus. The sisters had sent word to Jesus to inform him that Lazarus was very sick. But by the time Jesus got from where he was to Bethany, the village where this family lived, Lazarus had already died. So Martha came out to greet Jesus outside the village while Mary stayed home. And note the very first thing that Martha said to Jesus when she saw him, back in verse 21. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now later, when Jesus came to Mary, as Matt read for us in verse 32, 
her first words were exactly the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It seems that both sisters understood that Jesus could have gotten there earlier than he did. And indeed, he could have. Back in verse 5 of chapter 11, we read that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now, it's not that Martha and Mary were criticizing Jesus or accusing him of anything, but they were aware of the situation and they were grieving the loss of their brother. And even though they didn't ask Jesus a direct question, we can see that they were looking for some answers in the midst of their grief about how Jesus could have let this bad thing happen. He could have stopped it and he didn't. And they were looking for a response from Jesus. I mean, don't we all do that? We get confused by life and we're looking for answers and we would like a response from somebody who's supposed to have the answers. We might ask God directly or we might challenge people that we know, people of faith, and um, give them our questions. We just want somebody with some answers. I often feel that I'm supposed to be that somebody who has the answers and uh, when something bad happens people are waiting to see what my response is going to be. And I struggle with uh, knowing what the right response is going to be. See, both sisters made the same statement to Jesus and they awaited his response. I find it very interesting that Jesus' response was different to each sister, even though their statements were exactly the same. To Martha, Jesus responded with some solid and profound theology. Martha, you might remember, was the more practical sister. She was the one who, when Jesus came to visit, was all concerned about getting the house ready and getting the meal prepared, and she was annoyed with her sister because all Mary wanted to do was sit and listen to Jesus. <laughs> Both were doing good things, but what Mary was doing was better, Jesus told her. Martha was just more inclined to think about the practical implication of things. And so when she commented about how Jesus could have prevented the death of Lazarus, but he didn't, Jesus spoke to her about the concept of resurrection. In verse 23 and 24, Jesus talks to her and says, Your brother will rise again, you know. And Martha says, yes, I know that. I believe that there will be a resurrection of the dead when this world ends. I know that doctrine and I believe in it. But believing that doctrine right then wasn't making her feel any better. She wanted Lazarus to be alive now. But Jesus said in verse 25, that's not what I'm talking about, the resurrection at the last day. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. It is faith in Jesus that changes everything that we experience in death. When you trust in Jesus, you begin a new life that will never end, even though your body dies. When you trust in Jesus, you've already been raised from the dead to live a new life. Now, Jesus could have said, all right, let's just go to the grave. I'll, I'll call Lazarus out of, the, out of the dead for you. But he didn't do that. He knew that first Martha needed to be reminded about what she already believed. It was that faith that she already had that contained the answers that she was looking for. Now, for some people, that's what they need when they're grieving. They need to be reminded about what they believe. And Jesus asked Martha specifically, do you believe this? Very crucial answer to that question is needed for, by all of us. But now, when Mary made the very same statement to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, Jesus didn't make any profound theological pronouncements to her. He didn't challenge her faith or ask her any questions. He saw her weeping and other friends of theirs weeping. And he said, well, let's go to the grave together. And there at the grave, he just cried with them. He was moved by the sadness of those around him. Not only does this show that Jesus was human, but it shows that he was a man of tenderness and compassion. Now, just like he could have done with Martha, but he didn't, he could have just told Mary, okay, don't, don't cry, don't cry anymore. I can't take this, don't cry. I'll, I'll go raise up Lazarus again. Everything will be all right but everything wasn't all right. Man's sin had brought death into the world. And that means that in this fallen world, loved ones die. And when that happens, our grief is as deep of an emotion that we can feel. And Jesus felt that grief of what sin has done to humanity. The wages of our sin is death. God felt that grief when his own son died. And God feels your grief when your loved one dies. 
That is evidently what Mary needed most from her Savior. She needed to know that Jesus cared. His tears were a testament to how much he cared. He too cared for Lazarus. He too was sad that Lazarus had died. He cared for Mary and Martha. He cared for others who were hurting. And he wept for the pain of his friends. In verse 36 of chapter 11, we see that those who witnessed Jesus weeping remarked about how much he must have loved Lazarus. And here they see this public figure who was publicly weeping over the loss of his friend. But others didn't understand. They, they couldn't see why Jesus would need to cry when he had the power to have stopped this from even happening. But it was important that Jesus wept. Even though victory was just moments away and Lazarus would be raised from the dead and presumably live many more years and before he died an old man, Jesus wept over his death. And he wept over the pain of those that he loved. As Christians, the Bible tells us that we grieve not as those who have no hope, but still we grieve. We don't have to put on some smiley face and pretend that everything is all right when it's not. We're not told that we need to do that. Some Christians feel that you just have to be strong and be tough and be happy no matter what. Yes, we do have the assurance of victory over death and the grave, and that assurance means everything in the world to us. But still, it hurts to lose a loved one. Even though the pain's only temporary, and we know that, it's still painful. And it's okay just to hurt for a while. If Jesus wept over Lazarus, even though he knew that he would raise him up again, we can grieve our losses, and we can allow others to grieve their losses, and we can grieve with them. That doesn't mean you don't have faith. It doesn't mean you don't trust in the Lord. It just means you hurt, and it's only natural to let yourself hurt. This gives us great insight in how, into how we can minister to others that we love who are grieving losses. The tricky part is in ministering to others is to have that discernment to know how best to help them. Some people are more like Martha, and they really need to be reminded about what they believe and to not let their pain turn into bitterness and anger and resentment. Others are more like Mary, and they just need to know that you're there, that you care, and you understand. I would say if you're in doubt about that, just go with the latter. Just, just be there and care and grieve along with them. Wait until later to talk about theology and try to give answers to the questions that people have. And just pray for the discernment to know whether God would have you to do anything else. A second time that we read that Jesus wept is found in Luke's account of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that day that we call Palm Sunday. Now that is certainly ironic that we refer to it as a triumphal entry when Jesus himself didn't look at it that way. You would think that he would have in Luke 19.37. We read that... Uh, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Multitudes of people lined the streets and shouted praises to Jesus, and they named him as the one who came in the name of the Lord. You would think that Jesus would have I don't know, felt like Sally Field did when she won her second Oscar. Remember that speech she gave? She said, you like me. You really like me. But Jesus didn't say that. He didn't get caught up in all the adulation. In fact, verse 41 tells us that when he came to the city and looked over it, he wept over it. These were tears of sorrow for the city for their lack of faith. Yes, Jesus felt sorrow over the death of Lazarus, but knowing that he would raise him up again, the tears that he shed there were mainly tears of sympathy and compassion for those that he loved. But here, the tears that he shed for Jerusalem were tears of sorrow because he knew that most of them would ultimately reject him and never come to know the salvation that he had come to offer them. He said in verse 42, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. There are a couple of different ways of interpreting what Jesus was saying here, but both of them ultimately express his sorrow over the lack of faith of God's people. Some interpret this as Jesus was despairing over his knowledge that one day Jerusalem, the whole city, would be destroyed. 
And indeed, in AD 70, it was completely destroyed. The Roman army not only destroyed their precious temple, but the entire city was destroyed during a four-month-long siege that began just before the Passover celebration, when throngs of people from all over the world were, were coming to celebrate. Uh, Josephus in historical records reported that over one million people died in this overthrow, not only from the violence, but from the starvation that, that resulted following it. And that in itself would certainly be enough to make Jesus weep tears of sorrow over what he knew would one day happen. And as, as some interpret those tears, if only the people had realized that Jesus was their Messiah who had come not to free them from Roman oppression, but rather to free them from the bondage of their sin, then perhaps they would not have continued in their rebellion against Rome, and the city would not have had to have been destroyed. Jesus may have been saying, your rebellion is not going to be what brings you peace. It's not going to do you any good. One day this whole city will lie in ruins. And that could very well have been what he meant. I don't know. But others say that Jesus was talking about more than just the physical destruction of the city. They say that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed no matter what. There's no getting around that. But if the people had just recognized the time of God's coming through Jesus, if they understood that Jesus had come to save them from their sins, that when the city was destroyed and hundreds of thousands of them would be killed, that they would not have to die in their sins. They would have been given eternal life if they had only believed. And that too could have been what Jesus was saying. But either way, it's probably both at the same time. Jesus is overlooking this glorious city, the home of his chosen people, and he knows that most of the people there would not believe that he is God's anointed one, sent to save them from their sins. And that one day this city would lay in ruins and the multitudes who were there crying for peace and shouting praises to him on that Palm Sunday would go to their deaths without the forgiveness and the salvation that he came to give them. And that was what made Jesus weep on that day. And we see from his tears that Jesus feels sorrow for those who are lost in their sins. And I'm sure that as God looks over us in our day and age and he sees those things that we take glory and pride in, our enormous cities with huge skyscrapers, our incredible advancements in technology and communication, our universities filled with people getting advanced degrees and going out to make huge salaries, that God weeps in sorrow over the majority of his prized creation who remain lost in their sins and do not recognize that Jesus came to save them. Jesus came to give them a life of purpose and of spiritual abundance and freedom. And the time of Christ coming again is upon us. It is at hand. God alone knows when that will be, but he has told us that there's coming a day of tribulation and destruction before Jesus comes again. There's coming a day when it will be too late to recognize the time of God's coming to us. And there will be many who will die while still in their sins. And we know from Jesus' tears that God feels great sorrow over that reality. Each of us as believers should feel that same sorrow over those that we know and love who do not know the Lord. May our tears of sorrow lead us to just say a loving word to those people. A loving word of the Christ who came to save us. Of the Christ who weeps for us. Of the Christ who died for us. The third occasion where Jesus shed tears, or it is at least inferred that he shed tears, was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was there that Jesus prayed that God would take the cup away from him and that Jesus could be spared from the agonizing death that he knew awaited him. And as I'm sure you know, even though this was his prayer, he obediently added, not my will, but as you will. He would obey what his heavenly Father told him to do. He would do what he was sent to do. But it's important for us to know how hard this was for Jesus. Matthew 26, 37 tells us that Jesus was sorrowful and troubled and that his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Luke 22, 44 tells us that being in anguish, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. But it's actually the book of Hebrews that adds the element of Jesus' tears to this occasion. Chapter 5, verse 7 says, He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. These tears, more than anything else, were tears of anguish for his own suffering that he would have to endure. We must never forget that Jesus was fully human as well as being fully divine. The knowledge of what would be required of him 
to take the punishment for our sins would be humanly overwhelming. I mean, imagine that if you knew tomorrow that you would be subjected to torture, to 40 lashes of a cat of nine tails whip, to nails pounded through your hands and feet, to be asphyxiated as your broken body hung from a cross until you just couldn't breathe anymore. And knowing that you could walk away from that, from having to endure that suffering if you decided you didn't want to do that in behalf of others. How could anyone bear the anguish of that knowledge? I would do more than weep. I would run as far away as I could. But Jesus didn't. He went to the cross to suffer and to die for you and me. And on that cross, even though it doesn't say that Jesus wept on the cross because he had already resolved to be obedient to his calling, still we are told that he cried out in anguish because of the awareness that God was turning his face away from his suffering so that he could pour out all of his love for us, that we might be saved. Jesus was forsaken so that we would not be forsaken. Jesus cried and died alone so that when we cry and when we die, we will know that we are never alone. As the old hymn says, he took our sin and our sorrow and made it his very own. He bore our burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How wonderful, how marvelous is the Savior's love for me. Jesus' tears of anguish are so significant. They were not tools of manipulation. You know, some people do that. You know, they can turn on the tears to get people to feel sorry for them and get them to do what they want them to do. And it's pretty effective. It works pretty well. But Jesus was not trying to persuade his Heavenly Father to give up on his plan to save us. He was just expressing in his humanity how hard this was. It's important for us to know what Jesus gave up so that we could live. His tears would not substitute for his own obedience. They did not cause God to change his purpose. Jesus' tears of anguish for his own suffering show us several things. For one thing, that we see that obedience includes tears. Now, one major reason that we would tend to disobey the Lord is because we want, are seeking to avoid a certain hardship, right? I mean, a child will disobey because he thinks things will be better for him doing things his own way. And we adults are the same way. We don't want to obey God because even though we might know that his way is always the best way, it's often the harder way. A life of following the Lord is going to include tears. There is suffering that we are all called to endure in this life. But what we also learn from Jesus' tears is that it's okay to grieve over the suffering. We don't have to pretend that we don't hurt when we do. I know some of you are in physical pain every day. Your back is bad, your shoulders hurt, your knees are weak, you're just trying to walk is hard. And we all know some people who can't even do that. I know some of you are in emotional pain every day. You've lost loved ones. You have relationships that might be strained. You've had losses of other kinds. And it hurts. It's okay to hurt. Yes, I know the spiritually mature thing is to realize that God has a purpose for your suffering and he is able to use your suffering to bring glory to himself. That we know is true. The God's word tells us that. But still, it's okay to let us know that you're hurting. And we want to hurt with you. But above all things, do not let your suffering be something that would make you turn away from God, but rather let it be that which makes you run towards him. Jesus' tears were for that very purpose, so that you can approach Almighty God with your requests, with your pain, and you can trust that he is there to help you. It is through our faith in the Lord that we can have the knowledge that there is coming a day, the Bible tells us, that God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Revelation 21.4 encourages us in this hope. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things are passed away. And we love that verse, don't we? But along with it comes that implication that there will be tears that need to be wiped away. There will be suffering in this life. God is doing a work in our lives that includes suffering. But as Psalm 126, 5 says, Those who sow in tears shall reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy. Jesus wept. Jesus' tears were not a sign of weakness, but rather they were an outpouring of the strength of his character. He shed tears of compassion for the pain of his friends. And because he did that, we can know that he has compassion for us. As Hebrews 4.14 says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. How good it is to know that. 
And may Jesus' tears of compassion inspire us to have compassion on others who are suffering. He shed tears of sorrow for the lack of faith of his people. Let us, let those tears soften our hearts toward those around us who do not believe and who need to know so much of the, the time of Christ's coming. And he shed tears of anguish regarding his own suffering that he endured so that we could be saved from our sins. Let those tears inspire us as we go through whatever suffering that we might have to endure, that we can know that God does have a purpose for it, and we can say like the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. What a comfort it is to know that no one understands like Jesus.